Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Vetch and I am a park ranger with the Niobrara National Scenic River in Valentine, Nebraska. I am with the National Park Service and joined today by Emily Fisher who will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Emily Fisher and I am with the Nebraska Writing Project and we are so pleased to bring this special opportunity uh, to you. So we will be um, learning today about the Niobrara National Scenic River and its prehistoric species um, through geology and paleontology. So first things first, we want to explore what is the Niobrara National Scenic River and what makes it so special? Okay, the first thing that you're going to need throughout this whole lesson is a thinking tracker. And basically what this is, it's a t-chart. So grab a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. And what you're going to do is you're going to think about what it says and then what I say. It says is basically anything that is a text. Now remember, text can be pictures. Text can be what Maggie is going to talk to you about. Text doesn't just have to be writing on a page. So you want, you're going to be able to take information that you're given or you learn. And then when you, when you have I say, that's where you can think about what you think about that information. So questions you have, ideas you have, basically it's up to you. So the Niobrara National Scenic River is a National Park Service site in North Central Nebraska. Um, so we protect 76 miles of scenic river starting in Valentine, Nebraska, and then uh, going to the east, um, we have six different ecosystems that meet at the river's banks, including three different forests and three prairie systems. So the roadmap for this lesson is that we're going to cover geology and paleontology on the Niobrara River. Um, we'll talk about five different soil layers that uh, have formed over time along the river's banks. And for paleontology, we're going to be talking about some specific eras in time. And why we're doing this is we want to see how geology and paleontology work together to tell the story of climate change and landscape change over time and give us a bigger picture and a different lens to look at history with. Okay, so you're going to grab that thinking tracker and you're going to think about some of the information that you just learned from Maggie. So I wrote down that she said, putting the soils and location of the fossils together tells a story of climate and landscape change over time. And that's what I learned from the information. And what I say about this, I had never thought about how geology and paleontology could give me two very different versions of history. So there was a lot of really cool information that Maggie said there. So for example, there's 76 miles of scenic river. There's six different ecosystems along the Niobrara River. So you could think about some of those things and take a minute to write down something that you learned from Maggie under it says, and then write down what that makes you think, question, wonder, or anything like that on your thinking tracker. So in this next section of our lesson, we're going to explain a little bit more about the story of the running river through time. So the Niobrara River has been flowing for many, many years, um, but there also was a period when it wasn't here yet. So where does our story start? Um, the Mesozoic era is that first big chunk of time that we are going to talk about today, and that has the Jurassic period and the Cretaceous period within it. And then we're going to jump into kind of our second chapter, which is the Cenozoic era. And there's a lot of different periods of time within it. They're all listed there. Paleozoic, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, Holocene. And there is a lot of vocab in this lesson. Um, so we'll break it down a little bit further as we go. But just know that there's a couple different chapters in this story. Um, where we're going to start is probably your first question, which is where are the dinosaurs in all of this? When we think of paleontology, which is the study of fossils and um, the remains that have been found in soil over time, um, we usually think of the dinosaurs, but our story on the Niobrara doesn't start with dinosaurs. Um, in the Mesozoic era, there is the Jurassic and the Cretaceous period, which we talked about a little bit. The Jurassic period was the age of the dinosaurs. So this is when dinosaurs were roaming across North America. Um, you would know T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Brontosaurus, kind of those big names. Um, and uh, the cool thing is, but we didn't have any dinosaurs in North Central Nebraska, and that's because we were underwater 
there's a sea that runs through North America and it's very shallow, kind of almost tropical, clear blue waters, warm. There are sharks in it. There's early fish. You've got um, clams and corals and just this ab abundant life in the sea that you would never think of in the middle of North America. Um, but on the slide, there's a couple photos of the mosasaurs and the plesiosaurs, which are the big prehistoric reptiles that were actually living in these seas and oceans in north central Nebraska of all places. So we found um, early shark fossils. We found plesiosaurs, which kind of look like the Loch Ness monster with these big long necks. Um, and they ate any fish or, um, or smaller animals they could find. They were great predators. Slowly as we moved out of that Jurassic era, when the dinosaurs elsewhere in North America were slowly kind of dying off, the mosasaur came along, which is this long eel-like creature that you can see on the slide. And the mosasaur was um, a ferocious predator. It ate clams, it ate plesiosaurs, which were very large, um, but it also ate fish, sharks, turtles, smaller reptiles, and it could crawl up on land a little bit. The, the earth was becoming a little more swampy. So um, these creatures had to be highly adaptable and use what they could to their advantage. Um, but this last picture on the slide is actually the soil layer that formed when that Cretaceous sea, that inner continental um, seabed dried up. So that's called the pier shale layer. Um, and it's the lowest one that we identify on the Niobrara River in our ge geologic story through time. Okay, so that was so, in so informative. Thanks, Maggie, and interesting. So what I would like you to do is pick something that you learned or that kind of really, um, you know, you took a special interest in and write that down. So I was really interested in how the abundant, the abundance of life, and it was more like a tropical shallow sea with clear blue waters. So I might write that down. And that makes me think about like, what kind of fossils are actually under or in the soil in Nebraska that I had never considered. Um, and so I'm just really curious to think about that. So take a moment and write a couple of those things down share with partners, go ahead and pause here. So the next stop on our story is to move out of the blue zone, that Cretaceous era, um, and into the orange era, which is the Cenozoic era. And the Cenozoic era is known for mammals. There's this column of catastrophic events that I've, we've got written down on our table here. And there's the theory that an asteroid hit kind of the Gulf of Mexico, the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula, and that massive climate changes were happening. And that's when the sea started to dry up um, and there was lots of ash and smog. And um, all of a sudden the waters are receding from the area of Nebraska and life is changing because the environment and the landscape are changing. So as we walk, as we um, journey into the Eocene and the Oligocene, um, and even the Miocene, which is our next chapters, um, we're going to be looking at the mammals that became abundant along the Niobrara River and in north central Nebraska. So the Eocene is a fun period because Nebraska was almost like a tropical oasis. Um, You'll see in this top photo, it, it looks flat. It looks like Nebraska. There's some trees and some grasses and some water. Um, but the creatures that were roaming during this time were well adapted to warm, wet climate. <laughs> there were these rhinos called titanotheres who had these big horned um, front. They weren't even tusks or horns. They were um, just kind of this growth off of the nose, but it looks like the ancestor of the rhino. And you can see then um, this lower left-hand picture is these very, very small, almost deer or horse looking creatures. And those are actually the earliest, some of the earliest horses that we find um, that originated in Nebraska. And they were very small. They were the size of goats. These very small horses had three hooves. So instead of that one big hoof that we normally see, they actually had two other toes sticking out the sides. Um, so in this era, we see rhinos and horses. Um, and then we're, we're going to discover a couple more species along the way as well. And then we walk into the next chapter, which is the Oligocene. 
And this is a period of kind of um, like explosive biodiversity. So life is growing and changing and new species are popping up. And um, this upper left-hand photo is a depiction of what most um, will say the Niobrara looked like at that time. Um, you've got more prairies, the soil is becoming a little drier, a little more arid. There's um, trees that are growing and they're, they're the trees that we identify more today. Um, so kind of like those oaks and um, just those taller leafy trees instead of more of those subtropic trees that we think of. Um, the horses are still roaming the prairie. They are eating grass and they're eating the leaves off of trees. So they're getting a little taller, longer necks. Um, they still have a couple toes, not just one hoof. Um, but you'll also see in this era that we've got more just um, cousins of those horses. We've got kind of like early zebras and we also have an exciting development that the camels are coming. Um, and these camels are a little different than you would think of. They don't have big humps. They're not those dromedaries, um, but they've got a little bit of a, a smoother back, um, but they're different than the horses. They are definitely their own species at this point. Um, there are also rhinos and some early elephants elephants, like the prehistoric ancestors of the elephants coming at this time. So there's a really fun picture in the middle here of what's called a, um, a bear dog. And there were predators at this time. It wasn't just those browsing um, or grass and leaf eating mammals. There were also predators. And so the bear dog is just one that we know of. There were also early cats, early canines. So the, the ancestors of wolves and dogs. Um, but they're walking on this soil that came from um, explosions out in Wyoming and Colorado. Those mountains are still forming to the west of us. Um, and so all of the dust and um, ash from those mountain forming explosions is actually drifting into what would be Nebraska and settling where this soil is becoming drier into what's called the rosebud layer. It's very hard packed. Um, and so this upper right hand photo is actually, you can see the red and that darker dirt color in the wall. That's the rosebud layer. Um, between that, the rosebud layer and the one that we're gonna talk about next, the Valentine layer is actually where our waterfalls flow out of, um, which comes about in the Miocene is more porous. It's more sandy. It's almost like a sandstone and it'll hold water really well. Um, and that lets us know also that the climate's changing. So into the Miocene, we've got even more life, if you can believe it. <laughs> there are elephants roaming, the early Gomplotherium and um, Ambliodon. You can see them in these photos on the slide. They've got different shapes of tusks. They have four tusks instead of two, um, just fascinatingly different than the elephants we know today. Um, and what's interesting is the climate is still drying out more and more. And some of those taller trees are dying off, but the grasslands that we know and are familiar to us on the Great Plains are becoming vast and broad. And so many of the browsers, those that ate leaves off of trees are not doing quite as well in this era. Um, and a lot of the grazers that ate shorter plants and grasses are doing really, really well. So we see herds of camels thriving um, and it almost looks like an African savanna um, of what we would think of today where you've got elephants and camels with long necks that almost look like giraffes. You've got the early deer, you have um, horses where kind of those those three toes we talked about earlier are going away you're getting to see more of those one hoofed um, horses that look a lot more like we know um, there are still a couple rhinos we're getting closer to the end of their life just because climate can't support them as much as it used to it's getting a little too dry the resources they need to survive and thrive um, are slowly just kind of um, being eaten away by changes in climate, changes in landscape. Um, there's also a really fun picture of this um, horned rodent, which might be like an early gopher or an early groundhog. Just there's these mammals are so familiar to us um, and we can tell from their fossils and in 
this soil layer, the Valentine layer that they were walking and living on, um, we find a lot of fossils. Um, they're really well preserved and it gives us a great fossil record that tells us about this era in time. And actually it's the lower right hand picture on this slide. That's the Valentine layer. And then above it, um, that's where our ash hollow layer comes in. And that's from explosions in um, Idaho and even further west that were blowing into the Great Plains, just settling um, and becoming the dirt that these mammals walked on. Oh, wow. Thanks, Maggie. That was so interesting learning. I'm learning so much about the climate of these prehistoric times and what it might have been like for these animals to uh, continue living or throughout this time. So go ahead and maybe pick one or two things. There was a whole lot of really awesome information there. Like I was really struck by how uh, Nebraska's climate went from wet to dry, to becoming more dry to support grasslands. I mean, all the way when we talked about from this, it used to be a shallow sea. Um, and thinking about how, you know, Colorado and Wyoming and Idaho have impacted Nebraska as well. So pick something to write down about, it says about the climate or the animals or anything that really kind of uh, stood out to you. And then write down what you have to say about it. And we'll pause here and you can share when your teacher says so. So next chapter in our story, we're going to be looking into the Pliocene and the Pleistocene. And now we're going to talk about the next set of climate changes that were coming for north central Nebraska. And now we're going to see kind of a dive in biodiversity because the landscape couldn't support what these mammals needed. Um, things were changing too fast and the resources they needed were going away. Um, so in the Pliocene, um, we're still seeing those broad grasslands. Those rhinos are kind of hitting the end. They're like out of the resources they need to do well, um, but we're still going to see elephants, camels, horses, um, and we're going to see some fun developments like a saber-toothed cat coming around. Um, the elephant species are changing. They're going from kind of those four tuskered um, gomphotherium and amblyodon into what we know as the mammoth or the mastodon, um, those big roaming creatures that just traveled far and wide for whatever they needed. Um, so what's really fun is that the camels during this time actually were about eight feet tall. These really long, long, long necks, they almost look like giraffes, which is kind of interesting. And the horses, what's fun is now they look a lot more like the horses that we know today. They've got that the singular hoof, um, and you can see in the photo, they are just roaming these vast grasslands. Um, but things are getting colder into the Pleistocene. There are glaciers coming from Minnesota and Iowa onto um, what would be the eastern side of Nebraska. So we didn't necessarily have like glaciers sitting on top of the Niobrara River Valley, but we had mammals that were trying to outrun the glaciers. Um, so you'll see the mammoth with, with the big rolling tusks um, and the mastodon um, with kind of these shorter two tusks. So you can see that the, the tusks on the mammoths are really big and you're going, why is that so different than the, um, than the mastodon with these short little tusks? And it's because the mammoth used those big tusks to clear out um, snow and ice and find the resources it needed beneath the snow. And so these mammals had to travel far and wide. They were not in one place, um, but we've still got those horses. They're also living on the edge of the glaciers, browsing um, or grazing and eating grasses. And also then those giant camels are still here. Um, the fossil records in Nebraska, I think there's only three or four, maybe five counties in Nebraska where there haven't been mammoth or mastodon remains, which is just incredible that they were thriving along, um, not just the Niobrara, but the entire um, Great Plains that we know. So the glaciers um, would have been growing and receding five or six times. Um, slowly you'll see kind of those horses that have migrated elsewhere. The camels um, have just kind of died off. Um, and the Pleistocene becomes known as this ice age, this strange period of time in um, North America. All right. 
So a whole bunch of really awesome information there as well. So write down a couple of things about what, what you heard that kind of stood out to you. Uh, I'm just thinking about how only a few counties in Nebraska don't have Macedon or Mammoth remains. That is like, I could write that down. I could say, that's amazing. I had no idea that they were so widespread across the Great Plains. I knew they were here, but I didn't know that they were all over the place. So go ahead, take a minute, write down a couple things, write down questions or comments or things you're thinking. Uh, we'll have you pause the video and share. So the last stops on our story, we're not going to cover very in depth because we're, we're starting to know them well. The climate after the ice age warms up. Um, it becomes very arid. Grasslands um, are still doing really well. The Niobrara River is flowing through these canyons. There are pockets of kind of cooler spaces where now we have aspen trees. The sand hills have formed. We've got dunes that are covered in grasses, but we've got humans. We've got bison. We're starting to see horses that we know. Um, the seasons are returning. We're starting to see three to four seasons a year. Um, and the predominant predator is the human. Um, so the, the Holocene is the last chapter, um, which we're actually still living in right now. Now we can look back and see the drastic story of changes in landscape and climate that the Niobrara River has experienced and how our geology and paleontology work together to give us a different view of what was happening years and years ago. So now that we have taken some time to learn about um, the Niobrara Scenic River in prehistoric times, now we're going to write a little bit about it and we're going to really kind of capitalize on your imagination and your ideas. So if you need to go back and reference that timeline, um, as you're thinking through that, that'd be a great resource. But I want you to remember, um, you know, when, when it comes to writing, we're going to be working really on drafting here. So the point will be to get your ideas out and onto the paper. So what we're going to think about is really what surprised you about prehistoric species along the Niobrara Scenic River in Nebraska? Uh, I, there were a lot of things that surprised me. So go ahead and really think about what was one of the most surprising things about that you that you heard and what you're going to do is you're going to choose one species and if you can't exactly remember the name that's okay uh we're going to show you some pictures in just a minute but maybe i'm thinking like one that really surprised me so maybe i'm thinking back to like the mosasaurus back when nebraska was under this shallow sea and it was a like almost like it reminds me of almost Caribbean tropical waters. You're gonna think about that and you're gonna choose one and you're gonna be able to reference your thinking tracker or your notes um, and also that timeline for when we're writing. Okay, so here are some of the species that we discussed. Maggie, would you uh, just go ahead and give us a quick reminder of what each one is? Absolutely, so the first photo, in the upper left-hand corner is our mosasaur, kind of a long eel-looking reptile. Um, and next to them, we've got the um, early camels. Um, they ate grasses and roamed far and wide in herds. Um, then we've got, in the bottom left-hand corner, um, an ancestor of the rhino. And this isn't Titanotheres, this is a cousin. Um, and they would have lived kind of in that warmer, tropical, wet, um, and done pretty well when there were trees and leaky, um, hardy plants to eat. And then our middle photo is actually early horse. And you can see in this photo a little bit like those three toes that we talked about. And then we've got this ancestor of the early elephant. So this is a four-tuskered um, gomphotherium. And they would have eaten kind of like it shows the, the leaves off of trees. Okay. So what we're going to do in the next few minutes is kind of tell the surprising tale of one of these prehistoric species. So I, um, what I want you to remember is we're in this kind of drafting stage. So you don't need to worry about your spelling. You don't need to worry about your grammar. You just need to get your ideas out on the page. Um, and I want you to remember our top, your topic is whichever prehistoric species you want to write about. The purpose is really to kind of inform, but it's kind of a creative uh, um, way to inform because you're really going to 
imagine that you are this species. So I want you to imagine that you're there and really visualize and you think about those descriptive terms. What does it feel like? What does the air feel like? Is it humid? What does it smell like? What can you hear? What other animals can you hear? So really personify or bring to life what it would be like to be this creature. And your audience, you're writing for uh, people just like you or us, like to who need to learn a little bit more about uh, Nebraska in prehistoric times. So what you're going to do is your teacher is going to have a timer. So you're just going to write for two minutes and then we'll pause. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to describe what you can see, hear, or smell using all those senses um, along the Niobrara River in prehistoric times. Now, remember, if you're a mosasaur, it's going to be a little bit different because you're going to be swimming in a shallow ocean than if you are a um, an early relative of the elephant. You're going to be seeing different things. Now, um, don't start yet till your teacher tells you. If you're if you're having a hard time saying, Emily, I don't really know how to start this. Use this sentence that I gave gave you. As I look upon the landscape, my eyes are drawn to. So you're writing in first person as if you are this creature. Two minutes, okay. And if you get stuck, just keep going. It's always okay to just keep writing and thinking about what you could see, hear, or smell. Okay. Go ahead and listen to your teacher for when you're going to start. All right, fantastic. I'm so proud of you for going ahead and really envisioning that. The next thing that we're going to think about and we're telling a story, it's always important when we're thinking about like a character or in terms here, you're the prehistoric creature about things that we worry about or, or concerns. So what you're going to do for the next two minutes is write about your worries or your fears or your concerns about life along the river. So you could think about, we heard that climate change or the changing climate was like a big, a big continual um threat. And as Maggie said, we know that there were predators there. We know that there were, um, you know, grass grazers, and then there were these predators there. So you can think about that kind of stuff. So if you need something to help you get started, you're going to start off with, although the landscape is, and you're going to fill in the blank, I worry that. Remember, that's just a starter. Then you keep going from there. Okay. Your teacher's going to tell you when to start. Two more minutes. Go. All right. So now we've talked about what, uh, what maybe makes us worry. Now we're gonna have two minutes to talk about greatest strengths. So Maggie really told us a lot about how some of these animals had different strengths or what are they really, really, really good at. And so I want you to think about what are your greatest strengths or what do you like most about yourself? Or this is sometimes fun to think about, why do other creatures like you or why do other creatures fear you? And so this one, um, so you can think about your weaknesses or maybe what do you want to do to improve? So there's a lot of ideas here, but two minutes to think about this and write about this. Listen to your teacher, go ahead and start. Okay, fantastic. The next two minutes, what are your hopes and what are your dreams? So as what think about you as the creature, what do you really hope for? Do you hope for a continual food supply? Do you hope that the, the climate continues to be whatever you need it to be? Um, and so you want to maybe think about that. So go ahead and for two minutes, write about what you hope, what you dream. And if you need a sentence, then you can start with, I hope that. Okay, go. All right. Finally, this one only has one minute. But what do you want history to remember about you? Uh, and we know that we have these fossils uh, in Nebraska and we're learning about them. But from your perspective as a prehistoric animal, what would you want history to remember about you? Um, and, and, and why is that important? So if you need to, a sentence to start, you can write, I want people to remember or history will remember me because. Go ahead. All right, so now it comes down to sharing your surprising tales uh, about their prehistoric species. The one thing that I might ask you to do is either um, title your writing with the species that you that you uh, wrote about, or at the end, you could say, I am 
um, whatever the species it is. And remember, these are drafts. And so these are just works in progress. So if you want to go back and add more details, look back at the timeline. Maggie's going to tell you about some resources where you could go. This could be a really amazing way for you to tell even more, uh, more about the surprising tale of your prehistoric creature from Nebraska. So if you want to learn more, you can find um, resources from the Nebraska Writing Project and the National Writing Project on their websites. Um, and to dig deeper into the geology and paleontology of the Niobrara National Scenic River, you can check out our website, which is www.nps.gov backslash Niobe, N-I-O-B, and find our paleontology and geology pages. Um, there are also other resources um, that we will link to in kind of the video notes. So quick credit to our slide deck um, from Slides Carnival and a big thank you um, in partnership to the Nebraska Writing Project. Um, we are so grateful to work with them as the National Park Service to put this lesson together for your classroom and feel free to reach out to um, Niobrara National Scenic River if you have any questions about this lesson or the resources used and we will um, be very helpful in finding you what you need.